Hi, my name is Elliot and I'm a fourth year Asian Studies Honors student. Today I'm here to interview alumnus Mr. Jimmy Mitchell here at his downtown office in Vancouver. Hi, uh, my name is Jimmy Mitchell. I'm the principal of my own consulting firm, Near West Consulting Services here in Vancouver. I am an alumnus of UBC. I have a master's degree in Chinese history and politics from 1995. So there are a few questions prepared here that I'd like to ask Jimmy, and so I'll be picking them out successively from the box. What was the most unforeseen thing that happened over the course of your career? When I got out of grad school uh, in, in history, Asian studies at, uh, at, at UBC, I went back to live in Taipei. Well, I was reconnecting with friends. I got a phone call from somebody I knew, and they said, hey, uh, the, uh, the radio station up on the mountain is looking for a reporter. A couple of days later, and interviewed for the job, and. A few days later, they called me up and they said, you're now a reporter, which was completely unforeseen. I had no idea that I would end, and I did that for almost three and a half years. After the radio station, my next job was uh, a bunch of friends and I started a newspaper in Taiwan called the Taipei Times, and, and I was the founding news editor, and I did that job for about a year and a half. And then one day, this was right after a fairly significant election in, in Taiwan, and I was very busy, and it was sort of crazy time. And I had blown off uh, an invitation for lunch by the executive director of the Canadian uh, Trade Office in Taipei, the uh, not ambassador as we called him. And so the next day I, I, I went down to the, to the office and uh, he took me in and sat me down. Basically he said, how would you like to work, come and work for the uh, Canadian government as a diplomat? And I was like, what? <laughs> uh, so that was unforeseen. It plays to the point though that when, you, when you're doing things that are relevant, to your knowledge, your education, the, where you are and what you're doing, opportunities will come your way if you are visible and if you're having fun and enjoying yourself. So how has your Asian studies degree or your language skills contributed to developing your career and did you end up where you had originally expected? The reason I came back to do my MA to begin with was because I, I had been living in on the mainland and in Taiwan. I had a great interest in Chinese politics, but I needed to be credentialized. The degree itself was highly academic. It was a, it was a history MA and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, background, a lot of uh, research and that type of thing. But, and, and that helped me, I think, in, in, in terms of career development, but it was, that was a standalone piece. I think it was more the, the language skills. Right. Um, I think it's true to say that I would not be able to do what I did and I would not be able to do what I do now if I had not spent the time in uh, learning the language properly. As part of my MA, my thesis advisor said, you are not going to get your MA under me unless you learn how to read and write. Um, and so I ended up going back to Taipei for almost a year in 1994 and took a, a year of university courses, language courses in Chinese. And that was what allowed me to do my research properly. But I think since then, when I think of all the things that I've done in my career, I was a journalist, I was a diplomat, I'm working in business development and trade and investment. The majority of my clients are Chinese, uh, and, and I spend a lot of time in, in China. And so it, it just becomes a part of what you do. Um, I think, you know, it's not about love of language. I never studied Chinese because I thought Chinese culture was wonderful or anything like that. Not that I don't, but that was not the purpose. If you think about your language skill as a necessary part of your, your CV and your ability to work in a particular area that makes you special and different, right. that's the reason to study language. If you could give yourself a piece of advice earlier in career, what would it be? If there was one thing that I would have advised myself, to take yourself somewhat seriously, uh, but not too seriously. I mean, I graduated from university when I was 23 and moved to China, and without really knowing anything, I really didn't pay much attention to where I was going in terms of what, what the future was. And it wasn't until I was about 28 that, that I realized that, geez, maybe I should do something with my life other than wandering around the world. Putting a mind to how do you make use of what you've studied into something that's going to be useful or fun or instructive or whatever it is, um, to try and make use of that while it's still fresh in your head that you're able to use that experience and translate that into something that will get you further on in life. How does networking actually work in your opinion? When I was younger, we didn't call it networking. It was just hanging out with people and getting to know them. Maybe 10 years ago, 12 years ago, where, where I first heard the term networking event. I was like, well, what the heck is that? What does it mean? It's, it's a place where you go and network with people. But to that point, I would say that networking only really works if it's done without a specific goal in mind. If you want to really 
go for the hard sell and looking for a job, go to a job fair. Uh, networking is where you be yourself. Talk to interesting people about interesting things. You get to know people so that you're on the radar screen of people. I mean, alpha networking events, we exchange cards and this and that, and 99% of the time you don't end up using the card or, 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 or the thing doesn't work out. But if you're out there in the community and you're talking to people, you're going to events and you're talking to people and, and, and you're being social and being yourself, people will learn who you are. I think that net, net networking is really just about, about talking to interesting things about yourself and listening and getting to know people. I guess this would go for your undergrad, but also for your master's, but what was one of the biggest obstacles in deciding a career path? Okay, well, the first thing that comes to mind is that obstacles are, are all in our heads. Mm -hmm. At almost exactly the same time that I graduated with my degree in theater, I realized that I didn't want to be an actor. It was an obstacle uh, until I wrote to my father, uh, who was living in Beijing at the time. Uh, this is back in 1986. And, and I said, Dad, I, I don't know what to do with my career. I, I got out of school and I don't want to be an actor anymore. I, I hate the business. What should I do? And he said, why don't you come to China? And again, when I got out, I really had no clue what it is that I wanted to do, but um, I was able to keep my field of vision fairly broad. I had language skills. I had skills on the ground working and living on both the mainland and Taiwan. I knew some people. I had good social skills, um, I had reasonably good uh, professional writing and, and those types of skills. So I never looked at things in terms of op obstacles. Mm -hmm. I always looked at things in terms of opportunity. Uh, I said earlier that, that uh, you know, I, I didn't expect to get a job as a reporter in, in, in Taiwan in 1995 and suddenly there, there it was happened. I would have had no illusions that I would ever become a diplomat until somebody gave me a call and asked me if I wanted to be a diplomat. And, but you only get to that point when you're networked, when you get to know people, when people know who you are, they know what your skills are, and that's out there. And so people are going to find you if they think that you are going to be good for that company or that organization or whatever it is. Okay, what are the biggest challenges, in your opinion, of moving to a different country? And do you have any tips on cultural obstacles, finding a job or housing, and making friends? When you're going to places where... Um, it's either not your comfort zone or it's a place where you're, it's your second language. That, that can obviously be, be challenging, but let me put it this way. Couch potatoes don't go live in other countries. Those of us who bother to go overseas and travel and, and do things tend to be the kind, type of people who are easy to talk to people, um, uh, you're interested in acquiring whether language or culture or whatever skills, and being sensitive. But having said that, I think that you know, once you're able to crack the basics of a language barrier, right, and I always tell people, try and learn a little bit before you go. But if you're able to crack that language barrier, that will open up everything else. That will open up social opportunities and job opportunities and what have you. I don't, I don't think I have any particular advice other than that you know, you gotta keep your eyes open. You gotta be listening to people and you have to be open to things that are completely new. And even if they shock you, or even if they really surprise you, sometimes just being able to be chill and absorb it and learn and move on, uh, that's always uh, the best way. But you know, again, people who bother to do that are the types of people who are gonna succeed anyway because they've gotten off the couch, learned a language, gotten a degree, and now they're over there doing it. And I never worry about these types of people. What was one of your biggest assumptions going into your career and how has it been proven wrong or right? Well, assumptions are always very dangerous. I think I've been lucky in that in a lot of my career, I've had very few assumptions. Um, I try not to assume that something's going to be easy or that something is going to be, you know, going to work out. You sort of have to, you have to avoid being overly optimistic about things. But if there's one thing that I can say, if you're passionate about something and if you're interested in something, that if you cast aside all of that other stuff, all of the baggage, all of the fears, and sort of, you know, you're not sure if you're good enough for something. If, if you just throw all that away and say, you know what, this is a great opportunity for me to do something, mm -hmm. and you assume that you've got the, you, that you've got, it's, it's a gut feeling. You assume that you've got the chutzpah mm -hmm. to make something happen. And I think that's always been my, uh, sort of the, the way that I've operated in life. Every, every time something has happened, I've always thought, you know, I think I can do this. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be an adventure. And rather than assuming what's going to happen at the end of it, 
that sometimes the journey of doing it is actually what you get out of it, as opposed to, well, I make a million dollars a year or, or, or whatever it is. Making assumptions that are, that are unrealistic or, or, or too high will always get you into trouble. But it's just assuming that you can do it if you're having fun and you're interested. That's the way to go. I hope you all enjoyed watching my interview with Jimmy. And, well, I'm sure I learned a lot, so I hope that was beneficial for you. I'll see you around on campus. <laughs>